Well, thanks for joining us for tonight's webinar to infant and beyond looking at nutrition through the life cycle. I'm Greg Berry, director in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Since we are in a virtual setting, please excuse technical issues or glitches that may pop up. If you have any problems with your video or audio, click the reconnect button at the top of your screen. Also, tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website tomorrow morning. Today's presentation is the third in a four part series on nutrition your diet, and you. You can check out the other webinars in the series by visiting alumni.uab.edu slash videos. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Lizzie Davis back to our webinar series. You may remember that Dr. Davis and some of her students joined us last November for the Science of Thanksgiving. Dr. Davis is a registered dietitian and currently is an assistant professor and director of the Dietitian Education Program in the UAB Department of Nutrition Sciences. She earned her Master of Science in Foods and Nutrition Science from East Carolina University in 2015 and became a member of our family here at UAB in 2020 after obtaining her Doctor of Science in Foods and Nutrition Science from the School of Health Professions. So at this time, I would like to formally welcome Dr. Davis back to our webinar series. Thank you again for joining us and the platform is yours. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here tonight to talk to everybody. Um, so as Greg mentioned, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition Sciences, um, also director of the Dietitian Education Program. This is a program that trains students to become registered dietitians. Um, but I think most notably, um, what gives me the most, I guess, street cred for, for talking on this topic tonight is that I am the instructor of NTR 232 um, in the Department of Nutrition Sciences, and that course title is Lifecycle Nutrition. So that's what we're going to be talking to, about tonight. Um, I'll also mention that um, in the past probably a few months, I've been able to go through most of the life cycles um, to date. And so I'll also have some personal experience behind this. Um, I, I have a five month old who I can hear in the background. So hopefully he's, he's not too loud for y'all. Um, but with that, we will go ahead and get started. So when I keep tossing out this life cycle stages, um, you might be asking yourself, what are these life cycle stages that you're talking about? Well, there's some major ones that we'll talk about throughout this presentation, and it starts at preconception and it ends at older adults. So we include preconception, conception, pregnancy and breastfeeding, infancy, toddler, child, adolescence, adult, and older, older adult. So a lot of, of things to cover tonight. I love talking about this topic because, I mean, I could talk about this stuff forever. Um, you could spend a week, and in fact, I do spend a week in, in the course that I teach, Life Cycle Nutrition, talking about each one of these. So the amount of information that I could talk about is overwhelming. Um, but with that, it's kind of a difficult topic to talk about. Um, one being that each stage of the life cycle has unique nutrition considerations. So there's key nutrients that are really important at each one of these different life cycle stages. Another reason why this is a difficult topic to talk about is because each stage has more common diseases or diseases that are more typical that you'll see um, among these different life cycle stages, which in turn causes these specific nutrient considerations that you need to have. And then lastly, it's a difficult topic to talk about because um, there's different developmental stages also associated with each of these life cycle stages, and that could impact nutrition. So um, an example that I like to give is with adolescents. This is really the first time in their lives that they have been in charge of their own eating. So they start to take ownership of what they are going to eat. Previously, as a child, their parents were saying, here's what we're having for dinner tonight eat it, right? <laughs> um, but with adolescents, they're making up some of those decisions. Um, and so that's something that we need to consider when we're working with an adolescent person. Um, so, you know, those different developmental stages occur all throughout the life cycle. And so that's why I wanted to make my presentation goal very clear so that we know kind of what the goal is for this presentation. And we'll check in at the end to make sure that we've met it. Um, but the goal of my presentation tonight is really for us to gain an appreciation 
for how one's nutrition practices at one stage of the life cycle can impact to the health or nutrition at a later life cycle stage. So we'll see how all of these life cycle stages connect. So we're gonna start at the very beginning with preconception. And the big question that we're gonna answer here is how does nutrition at preconception stage impact conception? So just to make sure we are all on the same page, um, let's define these two terms really quick. So when I'm talking about preconception, I'm talking about that time during those reproductive years. So this is before pregnancy. When I'm talking about conception, I'm talking about that time during pregnancy, that, that fertility, um, once you know someone becomes pregnant, that, that stepping stone. So there are two major nutrition-related contributors to fertility. Fertility is going to be that successful conception, that movement from the preconception stage to conception. So those two major nutrition-related contributors to fertility include nutrition status and body fat percentage. So let's first break down nutrition status and take a closer look at that. So when we're talking about nutrition status, what we found is that specifically in females, when they have undernutrition, it is linked to decreased fertility. When I'm talking about undernutrition in this scenario, I'm talking about having an intake of less than a thousand calories per day, which is not a lot at all. Um, what we found is that if a woman was previously well-nourished, so they've had um, the amount of calories that their body needs to function, and then they instantly have this decrease in nutrition, we see about a roughly 50% decrease in their fertility. And so populations that this might be concerning for are those who are excessive dieters, um, some select eating disorders like bulimia or anorexia, and then some food insecure populations. So an example of this actually happening in history, and we've been able to really study this, um, is during World War II, um, specifically Holland. So what I'm showing you here is a map of, um, of Holland, North and South Holland, um, which is all part of the Netherlands. Um, you can see how close this is to Germany. Um, and so obviously during World War II, Germany was a major player, and so because it's so close to proximity of Holland, they were in the thick of things. Um, They're right in the middle of it. And what Holland saw was extreme famine, food shortages. Um, a common example, I don't know how, how often you guys read Audrey Hepburn literature, um, but some quotes that she's given in, in her autobiographies, um, she's talked about her life growing up in Holland. And during this time where there was extreme famine. And what she said was what they had available to eat during this time was one slice of bread and some very watered down broth. So you can imagine that's not a lot of calories to sustain on. And so what, um, let me kind of acclimate you to what I'm showing you here. Um, so if you look at the X axis, so left to right, what you're seeing is um, 1943 to 1946. These are the dates um, of a portion of World War II. Um, and then the little tick marks are the months. So I have blocked off that period of famine in Holland. And um, what this, this line is showing you is the caloric intake. So if you look at, it's kind of a funky chart, um, the little Y axis here, it's the caloric intake. Um, if you look during the period of famine, you see that the caloric intake falls below a thousand calories per day. So people were not eating very many calories. And hang with me, cause I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth between um, a few figures like this to tell my story. Um, I've also, this is the same type of chart in the sense that I'm still showing you the period of famine between these two red lines. And then I'm still showing you the dates on the X axis from left to right. 
This y-axis though is showing you the weekly births. So the birth weight, the birth rates during Holland during this time. And you can see that during the period of famine, um, the birth rates don't really seem to change that much, but the time period after the period of famine, you can see that it very much declines. Um, and if you think about it, it takes nine months for um, a baby to grow. Um, and so that period of famine really caused the birth rates to decrease. So people weren't getting pregnant during this time. So what we found was that fertility um, has decreased during that time because of the lower calorie intake that we saw. Um, and there is about a 53% decrease in birth rate. So going back to this, this figure here, um, we saw that after the period of famine, so looking right after um, these two bars, we saw that caloric intake rose back to about 2,000 calories per day, which is what we would expect on average for a person to need. Um, again, talking about on average. So their caloric intake rose back up. And the cool thing is that we saw the birth rates also rise back up. Um, in about one year after the famine had ended, we saw birth rates um, get it back to where they were before um, that period of famine. So we we're bouncing around a lot. So let me make sure we're all on the same page. The take home message of those, those figures that I was just showing you is that undernutrition can cause a decrease in fertility in females. However, the good news is, is that when nutrition intake improves, fertility will also improve, but it might take about a year for that normal menstruation to reoccur. So we talked about how nutrition status was a contributor to fertility. Let's move on to the second thing, body fat percentage, and talk about how that is a contributor to fertility. One thing I want to mention, I'm just going to call it out now, is I'm going to use BMI as a body fat percentage. I know that you know that body fat percentage or that body mass index BMI is not a great use of body fat percentage, right? Um, if you were to look at the BMI of a bodybuilder, they would probably fall into the obese category when in turn we know that they aren't technically obese. Um, but I'm using BMI only because the studies that I'm going to show you also use BMI. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I'm, I'm just messaging the literature. Um, so please don't come for me. So looking at how body fat percentage um, plays a role in fertility, the interesting thing to me is that we're now talking about males and females, um, whereas before we were talking about just females. So with body fat percentage, it's going to impact um, the fertility. It's going to decrease the fertility for males and females when their BMI is less than 18.5 and greater than or equal to 30. And if we put these into the categories, that would put us where fertility decreases for those that are considered underweight and those are considered obese. So why, do, why does this happen? Um, well, it all comes down to hormones and there's alterations in some important reproductive hormones, including estrogen. So I'll kind of break it up for you. We'll first start with females and talk about how that plays a role um, in their fertility. So with a female, their menstrual cycle, this is a hormonal process that a woman's body goes through each month in order to prepare for pregnancy or a possible pregnancy. Um, and in order for this menstrual cycle to happen, four hormones are leading that cycle, leading that process. FSH, LH, estrogen, and progesterone. One thing that's really interesting is that fat cells actually produce estrogen. And so if you have more fat cells, you're gonna have increased estrogen and vice versa, less fat cells, less estrogen. And so what we're seeing is that hormones, when they're not in homeostasis, it's not ideal for that menstruation process to occur. 
So that's how body fat percentage is tied to fertility in females. For males, it's a similar but a little bit of a different pathway. Um, again, we're talking about estrogen. And so if you have more estrogen or less estrogen, that's going to be important um, because estrogen is driving that process, that fertility process, specifically with regulating libido. Um, and then also it's involved in sperm production. So again, when estrogen is out of whack in the body because it's made by those fat cells and you have either too much or too little, um, that's going to decrease one's fertility. So for a take home message to summarize everything that I just said is that body fat percentages are important for both the males and the re and the female's reproduction. And it really is important for ensuring that the um, hormones, specifically estrogen in the body are at homeostasis to make, make, make for that perfect um, environment for reproduction. So we're gonna move on to our next topic, um, our next life cycle stage. And we're gonna talk about pregnancy and breastfeeding. And the question that we're gonna answer here is how does nutrition at or during pregnancy and breastfeeding stage impact food preferences later on? And this is really important for developing the food repertoire through the mother's intake during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So let's dive through in, into that a little bit. Um, so it, what's really interesting to me is that taste preferences can be biological and environmental. So when I'm talking about biological, um, first, the sweet taste preference is, or the sweet taste is preferred at birth. When you think about things that are naturally sweet tasting or that are sweet tasting, you think about high energy density foods. These are foods you want to eat. And when you're thinking about an infant, these are foods that are good for survival. Um, also, speaking from the biological standpoint, bitter tasting foods are naturally rejected. Um, and this is to protect somebody. Um, so they have this innate rejection of um, poisonous or toxic substances. So they want to stay away from those. Interestingly, um, we typically think of vegetables as having this bitter taste. And so the cards are kind of stacked against us in a way. Um, but the good news is, is that environmental factors can also play a role in taste preferences. So looking at the environmental factors that come into play when developing someone's taste preferences, um, two things are really important. First is the mother's intake during pregnancy. And the second is the mother's intake during lactation or breastfeeding. So of course, I'm gonna break these down one by one for y'all. So this first study, um, this one is just so interesting to me that, that they did this. Whoever created this study is a genius because um, very creative. Um, so this first study, they had two groups of pregnant women. One group was given a capsule and it was like a garlic capsule. The next group was given a placebo. Neither group knew what they were given um, and you couldn't tell the difference um, just by looking at the capsule. It didn't have like this strong garlic odor to it um, from the outside perspective. So one group of pregnant women were given the garlic capsule, one given the placebo. Then what they did is um, those women conducted or had an amniocentesis procedure um, conducted on them, which is when they take a sample of the amniotic fluid. And what they found was um, they used a sensory panel. Um, and this part is what I think is so cool that they took people who literally for their job, they smell things. They're like professional smellers. Um, they took this sensory panel and they judged samples of this amniotic fluid and they could, they could tell which group had the garlic um, sent to it. And so what that told us was that the fetus is exposed to scents of food through the amniotic fluid. It's crazy the stuff that they do with, with research. It's, it's cool. Um, Another study, so this is a separate study, um, they took pregnant mothers and they had them try these different flavors, eat these different flavors, strong flavors, things like carrots, garlic, 
garlic, anise, and um, what they did was they found that after the pregnant mothers gave birth, they found that those infants who were about 5.7 months of age, where their mothers consumed these um, strong flavored items, they were more accepting of those different flavors when they were added to their infant cereal compared to mothers who didn't ingest these strong flavors. And so what that's telling us is that after births, infants are more accepting of foods that they were exposed to while a fetus. So taking a closer look at um, the mother's intake during lactation, during breastfeeding, and how that can impact taste preferences. Again, I'm gonna show you some more things from the literature. Um, they, there was a study where they took breastfeeding mothers and they had them try these strong flavors. So much similar to the, the previous study, except instead of pregnant moms, they took breastfeeding moms. And again, they had them ingest or consume these strong flavors like carrots, garlic, anise, mint, car caraway. Um, and these flavors were actually detected in breast milk through both chemical analysis and sensory analysis. So they had those that panel of professional smellers come back in and, and they could tell a difference. Um, one thing, let's see. Okay, yeah. Um, so moving on to more studies, um, there were two studies that showed that um, a mother who was breastfeeding, when she was consuming um, these strong flavors like carrots or vegetable juice during lactation, those infants who were between the ages of two weeks and four months, they had more acceptance of these flavored cereals later on at seven to eight months. So when they transitioned from breast milk to cereals that had mixed with breast milk, they were more accepting of those flavors that the mom was consuming earlier. One thing that's important to know, though, is that um, it was very specific to the type of vegetable that was consumed. So, for instance, if the breastfeeding mom had some carrot juice um, or had some carrots while they were um, breastfeeding and then later the infants around seven to eight months when mixed when the breast milk was mixed with infant cereal, um, the, the carrots would be more accepted. It wasn't like if they had beets early on, then um, carrots were accepted later. So it was like they had carrots, then carrots would be accepted later. So it's very specific to the, um, the vegetable. So to summarize that information, what we found was that um, there are um, windows of opportunity for making positive, positive and lasting lifestyle changes for our infants. Um, and we can increase food acceptance by doing some of those, um, making some of those choices during the breastfeeding in the pregnancy stage. So moving along to toddlers, I think this is one of my favorite age groups um, to talk about, um, just so because they're so fun and I love the studies behind this. They're so creative. Um, so what we're going to talk about next is how does nutrition at the toddler stage impact food regulation later? So let me tell you what that means. Um, this is actually the point during toddler stage where internal food regulation, so like their appetite and their satiety cues are established. So before the age of five, children are very aware of their satiety. So they know that when they're full, they know when they're hungry, and they have this really, really great ability to control their energy intake. Um, and interfering with this process can promote overeating. So let me kind of show you some studies to let you know exactly what I'm talking about here. So here is a study. And with this study, they had two groups of toddlers. And group in the first group of toddlers, they had some kind of diet drink, some zero calorie diet drink, so no calories in it. The second group, they had um, a regular full calorie drink. And the toddlers in both groups had drank their drink. 
One thing I'll mention though, is that neither group of toddlers knew whether they received the regular or the diet drink. These are toddlers, so it's not like they were older adults and they you know, had a strong preference that diet drinks taste artificial, something like that. They were just, they were just happy to drink it because it, it was sweet. After they drank their drink, they were served a meal. This isn't the exact meal that they were served from the study. It's just put there for visual representation. So they drank their drink and then they were served a meal afterwards. And what they found, this is the cool part, what they found was that the toddlers in the group that had the diet drink ate more than the group that had the regular drink. And they ate the amount more that was in the regular drink, the amount more calories that was in the regular drink, meaning that by the end of the meal, both groups had consumed the same amount of calories, but some had drank their calories and some have, had eaten their calories. And so what this told us was that children less than five years of age are great at self-regulating and understanding when their body physiologically needs more calories. They have these internal cues where they're like, I need more calories because I know I didn't just drink them, or I don't need more calories because I know, you know, my, my fullness cues um, or how much more energy that I need. Um, so second study, this is a different study. Um, this one's cool too, I think. So there was two groups of children. Um, one group of children were aged three and four. And then the second group of children was aged five. And what they did is they brought them in and over a three day period, they gave them different muffins. So the first day that they came, they gave them a small muffin. The second day that they came, they gave them a medium muffin. And then the third day that they came, they gave them a large muffin. And they calculated how much that they ate of that muffin each day. And what they found is that children who were aged three and four, so that first group of children, no matter what size muffin that they were served, they consumed the same amount each day time for each muffin. So the, the size of the muffin didn't impact how much that they ate. However, children aged five um, did, did consume more of the muffin if the muffin was larger. So um, the size of the muffin did impact how much that they ate and the, the bigger the muffin, the more they ate. And so that tells us that by age five, children are influenced by the size of the portions that are served to them. And so take home message of this is that at age five, there are other environmental factors that can come into the picture that can um, influence the um, self-regulation abilities that the children have. So what we do, what we recommend is that children are allowed to serve up their own portion sizes so that they can continue practicing um, that, that skill of self-regulation. They know how much they, they want to eat, how much they need to eat. And so us as adults, we're not going to know that like the child will. And so we need to let the children serve up how much that they want to eat because um, we don't want to disrupt that self-regulation ability that they are so, so good at. So moving on to this last section of um, the life cycle stage, um, it's not the last section, but we're going to talk about it over the course to the older adult. Um, the question asks here is how does nutrition at the life cycle stage or at, how does nutrition at the adolescent stage impact health later on? Well, adolescence is a critical time for bone mass development. And this is where a majority of the skeletal mass is formed. By age 18, about 90%. So most of that skeletal mass has been formed. 
Some things that can affect the skeletal mass development or formation are things like genetics, hormonal changes, weight-bearing exercise, cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, and nutritional factors, which is the one that we are interested in, right? Because we're talking about nutrition. So when we're looking at what adolescent age people in the United States are eating, it's not looking so good. Um, the, the things that they're eating is not doing well for their um, skeletal mass development. So they're not meeting the recommendations specifically for vegetables. They're only about 15% meet those recommendations. About 22% meet recommendations for fruit. Um, there's some key vitamins and minerals here, here, and these are all the vitamins and minerals that they typically have inadequate intakes of. If you see on this list, calcium is on there. So that's going to be um, a huge barrier to that development of um, that skeletal mass. And then we see that they have exceeded recommendations for total unsaturated fats, cholesterol, sodium, and added sugar. So um, these are typically the things that we don't want to exceed. Um, so they're not getting the things that, that we do want them to get, and then they're getting too much of the things that we, we don't want them to get as much of. So we established that they have poor nutrient status um, on average. And this will increase their risk for osteoporosis during older adulthood. Now, osteoporosis, I'm sure all of you guys know this, but it is weak, um, bones that are weak and brittle. And here's a picture of what this looks like. Um, starting off on the left, this is a case where um, there is an osteoporosis, and then it gets really, really bad here in the far right side, um, where it, the bones are very porous. If you think which ones you could probably break, um, definitely my money's on the one on the right. What we typically call this um, disease of osteoporosis is it's a geriatric disease with an adolescent origin, meaning that we typically see it in the geriatric um, life cycle stage or population, but it's originating from or starting from the adolescent age. So this figure right here kind of um, tells that story in the sense of if you look on the x-axis, so left to right, this is the age of years, the age in years of somebody. And then the y-axis is the bone mass. And you can see that um, males and females, they're mapped differently because males typically have a higher bone mass than females just naturally. Um, and so those are mapped differently. You can see they're way up here. Um, peak bone mass is occurring around the age of like 18 or so. Um, and then from there, it's a steady decline. Um, and so it's, it's going down. But you can see if you follow it over to the age 60, you might be at low bone mass, but you're not in the osteoporosis territory. So you're doing pretty good um, if you just have that natural decline of bone mass. Somebody who has the suboptimal lifestyle factors, so that would be someone with poor nutrition, um, they're starting way lower. Um, so when they go to dec decline, they're well into the osteoporosis territory. So obviously not good. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that this figure actually stops at age 60. Um, we know that people are living well past the age of 60. And so we wanna leave some room um, for when we are old and, and healthy um, so that we don't get into this osteoporosis category. Um, we don't get further into it. So we wanna be way up here into these, um, these above optimal lifestyle factors, which we can do so by, by good nutrition. Um, as I mentioned, this is especially important to develop um, bone mass, that good bone mass, um, due to the aging population. We are lasting way longer than the age of 60, which is what I'm showing here. Um, so the average age in the United States is 78.79 years old. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are establishing that good foundation um, of 
the strong bone mass so that we can have that natural decline without getting into that osteoporosis territory. Um, some reasons um, for having the longer life expectancy is things like immunizations, treatment of infectious diseases, decreased infant and childhood mortality rates, clean water, safe food. And this sweet lady right here, she is from France. She was the oldest known living person. Um, she is passed away now, but she lived to the age of 122. So if she was here, I would ask her, she should be the one giving this presentation of what's the secret to life um, for longer life expectancy. But um, yeah, the, the oldest known living person, 122 years old, that's amazing. So um, CDC does suggest that the longevity depends on um, access to healthcare, genetics, environment, but the biggest factor that the CDC contributes to longevity are life cycle, are lifestyle factors, and nutrition 100% plays a role in those lifestyle factors that contribute to longevity. And so to wrap this all up, I hope that I have showed to you, um, I hope you've been able to gain that appreciation for how one's nutrition practices at one life cycle stage can impact the health and nutrition at, one, at a later life cycle stage. And you can see how all of these different life cycle stages really connect to each other. So with that, I will open it up to questions and let's see how many more times I can see, say life cycle stages in this presentation. <laughs> I love it. I love the, uh, the the title of the presentation that we we came up with as well. A little nod to Buzz Lightyear in the year of, of light year, I guess. So I'll kick things off um, with questions. And um, if anybody in our audience has questions, drop them in the chat. We have plenty of time to go through these. Um, so basically what you're saying is kids are smarter than adults in a way. And, and let me explain just a little bit because one of our children, one of our kids broke a leg when they're learning how to walk. Well, we didn't realize this, but they were hobbling and they were basically not using that leg. I say that to mean eating is kind of similar. They get to the part where they're full and they don't eat any further. Is that kind of true in what I'm picking up? Yeah, I love that analogy. That's a really cool analogy. I might have to start using that one in class. Um, so yeah, kids have this really great ability. It's just naturally they're wired to do it. And as we get older, some of those environmental factors come into play. They might start, um, you know, eating for emotions or other outside of reasons, like it tastes really good. Um, so they start eating for other reasons. Um, and that part of that's just natural um, because we're human and we have emotions and we can't, you know, suppress that enough. Um, but um, I do know that a lot of times we worry that our little ones aren't going to be able to eat enough. I worry about it all the time um, with my little one. And so we, we overfeed, we offer more and offer more. And it's good to offer, but don't offer it too much where you're pushing it on them. Um, don't force them to um, clean their plate or, um, you know, before, the, before they leave um, the dinner table, they have to eat all of the food, clean the plate. So practices like that, we wanna try to stay away from and let the children guide the eating experience. I know um, Ellen Satter, who is kind of like the guru of all of this, she always says, it's our job as parents to provide the foods to eat, they we provide what to eat, and then it's the children's job to decide how much to eat. And so that's something that you can think about when um, during the next meal time when you feel that that parent guilt of are they eating enough? Kids are so great, they're so smart, as you mentioned, smarter than us. They they are getting enough. How can you build bone mass after the age of eight, eighteen? Yeah, so. Um, Unfortunately or fortunately, most of that is going to be built by the age of 18. Um, so one thing that you want to continue doing is um, eating calcium, calcium rich foods, and that doesn't necessarily always come from dairy. Um, a lot of times people think, oh, calcium, milk, yogurt, dairy products, but you can also get some of that from um, like dark green leafy vegetables, broccoli, you can find dairy in, um, in produce. 
Um, so you want to make sure that you eat your dairy. Also, vitamin D is going to help with that process. So when you think about your nutrients, think vitamin D and calcium. Um, another thing that you can think about is weight bearing exercise. So um, putting some of that stress on your bones is going to really help build them up. And so making sure you continue to exercise is going to be really important also. Sticking with bone density, this person's wife has a bone density test every few years, but their doctor wouldn't recommend the test for them. They're in their 60s. What's the reasoning behind that? Yeah, I don't I don't know why they wouldn't recommend it. Maybe it might be something like there's there's not much you can do, not like it's a bad thing, but you know, your your bone density is what it is at this point. Um there there are different tests you can do like a heel test. I'm not sure what the test that they did was. Um, but, um, you know, at some point it's, it's not so useful. There's not much you can do with it. Say, you know, your bone density is X amount. Um, what do you do from there? You'd be more careful. Um, but it's not clinically speaking, um, probably going to provide much, much more knowledge. Um, there's not going to be many more lifestyle factors that you can, you can do. I enjoy food. I'm sure a lot of people on here enjoy food as well. How do we as adults kind of train ourselves to say, okay, this is a nice spot of satiety where we don't overindulge, we don't overeat? Yeah, that is definitely a training process. Um, and so I think just being aware of what's on your plate, um, being aware of serving sizes. Um, this is something that us in America, we're a little bit guilty of. Um, we're a little bit off in our, our serving sizes. We're used to restaurants where they're probably giving us more than, more than we need. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know using the um, like serving sizes on a box can be helpful. So if you look at a box of rice, say you wanna make, um, like a fourth a cup of, of cooked rice, that sort of thing. So looking at the box and saying, this is actually what a serving size is. And these are the nutrients that I'm gonna get out of that serving size. So looking back to the box is gonna be important in retraining our brains and understanding, okay, this is a serving size. It's not actually a cup of rice um, or a half a plate full of rice. So going back to the box is gonna be really helpful with that. And the box is only a guideline because obviously I'm different than you, you're different than somebody in the audience. So we have to take that into consideration as well. Great point, yeah. So the box is always based on a 2000 calorie a day diet, um, which is for, I think they use like a, um, I forget how much the typical meal weighs, but they use a meal and um, it's like on average, someone who should be having 2000 calories a day, they're using that specific person. Um, but if you know that, you know, a fourth a cup of cooked rice, um, can can is what a serving size is then that can retrain you um to think oh this is a lot smaller than i thought it would be so not to get too too strong on on the calories or anything like that but we might say i do this all the time with potato chips right like oh one serving of potato chips is actually 15 not 45 which is what you know i might typically go towards Exactly. So th this person's feed froze, so they apologize if they missed something, but they wonder what kind of nutrition children and teens need to s need to stay optimal and avoid osteoporosis. Is it just calcium or is it other things as well? Yeah, so calcium, vitamin D is another big one, um, but overall general health nutrition is a big one. So when we're eating things that aren't very um, nutrient dense, and what I mean by that is that they're, they're calorically dense, um, and they don't have a lot of nutrients that back it up, having overall good nutrition is gonna be really helpful also. Um, and so keeping in with foods that they're typically low in, so the ones that I mentioned were like um, different vitamins, calcium, um, vitamin D, iron is gonna be a big one for that age group um, that they're typically low in because they are going through these big growth spurts, so iron's gonna be really important. Um, so just making sure they have good overall nutrition is going to support um, that longevity. This person has noticed that in infants with an early history of reflux, they have a preference of veggies over fruit, bitter versus sweet. Are there any studies on flavor preferences with infants on frequent medications? Um, I'm not sure. Can you read that question one more time? 
Sure. I've noticed that in infants with an early history of reflux have a preference of veggies over fruit, so bitter versus sweet. Are there any studies on flavor preferences on infants on frequent medication? So I think we're talking about like reflux medication um, is what I'm thinking. Go with it. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't know um, to answer that question. Um, I have, uh, this is an interesting topic that you, you've you asked this question about because I currently have an infant that is um, having really bad reflux problems. He's been on medica medication for reflux. He goes to weight checks every two weeks for reflux. Um, we recently put him on infant cereal um, and he's now trying carrots and um, squash um, because we're trying to do foods that are heavier because the milk just, you know, comes up. I have done a lot of research on this reflux um, topic for personal reasons. I haven't seen anything in the literature to support that, but I also haven't really seen a lot in the literature about this topic. Um, and so I'm hoping, it's funny, I was just talking to um, one of my colleagues the other day. I'm hoping that this is kind of the area that I go into next um, with the research, because as a mom, um, and I can speak for my husband too, as a dad for him, um, it's frustrating not, not knowing how to feed your little infant with reflux issues. Um, the medications, um, this is just a guess here, so please don't take this, but sure. um, the medications are, um, are like a, a um, fruity flavor. So it could be that they're trying to get away from that medication taste. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I haven't heard anything about that in the literature. So I'm not sure. You stumped me on that one. <laughs> Do you have thoughts on calcium supplements like calcium citrate or calcium carbonate? Um, I would, for that one, I'm a little bit out of my um, scope of practice as a registered dietitian um, in my area because I'm normally working with toddlers. So for that one, I would definitely say talk to your doctor about. Okay. So as an adult diagnosed with osteoarthritis, is it beneficial to take vitamin D and calcium or is it just a waste of time? Um... It, it, that's hard to say. It depends on depends on your age, depends on your stage. Um, I would say be careful with supplements. Um, again, it depends on your your stage of of, of disease. Um, be careful with supplements because you can very easily um, overdose with supplements as opposed to getting those um, nutrients and foods. Um, so I would say that's another one where you want to talk to your doctor about. And unless we get any other questions coming through the chat, this one will be one we wrap up on. How does menopause change women's nutritional needs? Is it too late to improve nutrition to avoid osteoporosis? So menopause is a huge um, contributor to bone density declining. And that's one of the reasons why males have um, just that naturally higher um, bone density compared to females. Um, and so it, it is related to hormones and the hormones play a role in making our bones not as strong. So some of that is just naturally occurring. It's something that happens. Um, we can't stop it from happening because we're females um, and we're great in so many other ways. But <laughs> um, the bone density is something where we are um, not as strong as males about. Um, but if we are focusing on that healthful diet, doing things like avoiding smoking, um, doing weight-bearing exercises, making sure we have that calcium, vitamin D, a strong um, nutrition background um, platform, then we are going to, um, you know, not decline as much into that osteoporosis um, range. So there is some things, or there are some things that we can do, but it is just a natural process of becoming, of being a woman. Uh oh, I don't hear you. I see you talking. I put myself on mute so I can communicate <laughs> on the back, and so I apologize. So th there's a couple questions that have come in um, since I solicited them. So recommendations for addressing extremely picky eaters. Where to start when overwhelmed, especially for a four four year old with a food allergy? Yeah, this is a tough one. It really is. Um, so some of the major ones, and I hope I give you some things that are. I'm sure you you've done your research um, as a mom. That's you know, you first thing you go to Google. So um, I'll give you some ideas, but I hope these are kind of new to you. 
Um, so for picky eaters, we do know that it takes about eight to 10 times of introducing that food to um, a toddler um, for them to be accepting of it. And so continuing to offer that food to them, it might seem like a waste, um, but maybe you, you don't serve yourself as much and then you can eat the rest of their leftovers um, if you're concerned about food waste. Um, but uh, continuing to offer it to them is gonna be important um, because the more familiar with they are, with it they are, the more likely they are to try it. Another thing is, which I'm sure you've heard this one, um, but I'll say it for, for others, is that getting them involved in the cooking process is going to be really helpful. Again, they become more familiar with it. It becomes fun. They're invested in it um, and they're excited about it. And so getting them involved in that is really interesting. Um, I worked with the Boys and Girls Club when I was in my master's and we would provide different fruits and vegetables to the kids. And we would always wanna make sure that there was at least one new item to them served along with foods that they were familiar with. And so it wasn't as overwhelming to them where they, they knew that there was foods that they, they were comfortable with. And then there was that one new item. Um, and so that kind of pulled them in a little bit and didn't make them immediately reject the plate. Um, they were more comfortable with it. And one aspect of the um, thing that we did with the Boys and Girls Club was we also had a garden. And I kid you not, this is a true story. Um, we grew turnips and the this one little girl came into the kitchen with the turnip that she was involved in growing she washed it off and she bit it like an apple and for me i love vegetables but i i will not bite a turnip like an apple that talk about bitter that is bitter yeah. and she was just so excited to try it and so um if you have you don't even have to have a green thumb just get out there and try to build a garden with your kiddos and they'll be invested in it and um, they might be more likely to try it. So there are some ideas, but um, my heart is with you because that's not easy, especially when you're trying to eliminate foods because of food allergies. Um, I would say stick with it and um, continue to offer those foods that they do feel comfortable with and try to avoid, I know it's hard, but try to avoid making mealtime um, an argument. Um, because then they go to mealtimes with a negative connotation and you're not going to make any headway. So kind of allow them to lead the process. You can just talk to them about the foods. Um, say you're trying to introduce avocados. Talk to, talk to them about what an avocado is. Show them a picture of where it grows. Make it kind of into a lesson. Um, and then lastly, sorry, I could talk about this topic forever. Um, <laughs> lastly, I'll leave you with this last one. Um, instead of us having an idea of, hey, I really want my child to try this, take them to the grocery store and walk around the produce aisle and let them pick what they want to try. Um, and then they're way more invested into it and it might be less of a fight. So I hope those are some, some ideas for you. Just try those. So are multivitamins good in providing the void in the diet for teenagers? Great question. Um, I always proceed with caution when I talk about multivitamins because they, you can easily um, get too much of a nutrient if you are having those those multivitamins, as opposed to if you're getting those vitamins vitamins through foods, then it's a lot harder to. Um, overconsume those um, those vitamins and minerals. With that said though, um, well, especially when you have those gummy vitamins, those you can just pop like candy. So I'd be careful with those um, if they don't, you know, put it into connection that, hey, this is, this is a vitamin, this is a nutrient, um, this is a mineral and you can get too much of it. So just be cautious of that. But I think multivitamins um, in a general sense are typically pretty good. Um, I take a multivitamin every day, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, everyone needs to. But um, always talk to your doctor about it first. But typically multivitamins are are just fine to take to, to um, fill that, that void in nutrition. Last question we'll field before we let you go on and, and become a mommy. And I know he's sleeping, but there's still mommy time. So th this person's working with a reg registered dietitian to primarily avoid kidney stones with lots of challenges to their current diet. Any comments on that and maybe some helpful hints? So what was the first part of that question? 
they're working with a registered dietitian to avoid kidney stones. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So kidney stones, there's actually two types of kidney stones that you can, you can get. And depending on which type of kidney stone you have, um, can differ what, what you would do. Um, so typically if you have kidney stones, they can test it and they can tell you what type of kidney stone you have. Um, so it just depends on which one that you have. And I think working with a registered dietitian is, is a great way to, um, figure out what, um, what diet you should have. Um, but I don't have too much beyond that. Um, it's kind of out of my wheelhouse a little bit. Well, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for spending the evening with us, spending the last hour plus with us and, and sharing insights into all of this as part of your experience. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. You're so very welcome. And just a reminder to tonight's audience, the webinar was recorded and a replay will be made available on our website tomorrow. And be sure to join us for other upcoming webinars. Next Tuesday, we will welcome Nancy Ball as part of an ongoing partnership with the UAB Office of Planned Giving for estate planning, understanding the basics. This webinar will take a look at an overview of what you need to know, as well as strategies to consider when implementing a plan. Then on Wednesday, September 14th, Dr. Suzanne Judd will join us for the final installment of our series on nutrition, your diet, and you. During Brain Food, discover more than 30 different foods that have brain function benefits. And on Thursday, September 23rd, be part of Blockchain and Web 3.0, a decentralized world. This webinar will feature brothers Dr. Christopher Edmonds and Dr. Mark Edmonds and will give us a better insight into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. We have plenty of other opportunities virtually for you to take part in as well. To find out more on these or others, visit alumni.uab.edu slash events. We're excited to be hosting Blazer Bingo at the Alumni House on Thursday, October 6th as part of Homecoming Week. Grab your lucky dragon statue or even dauber and join us for an evening of bingo. Registration is only 25 bucks and includes bingo boards, a dauber, and food. We also have a cash bar available for you. Blazer Bingo allows us to raise money for student scholarships. Register or find out more at alumni.uab.edu slash bingo. Meanwhile, take the UAB National Alumni Society on the road wherever you go with the UAB Green and Told podcast. New episodes are released every other week and feature conversations with members of our UAB community. Download episodes on Spotify, the Apple Podcast app, or our website. And be sure to stay on top of all things alumni. Find us on social media by searching UAB Alumni on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, or UAB Alumni Career Community on LinkedIn. Finally, what do you think about tonight's webinar? Let us know by scanning the QR code on your screen. We'd love to hear your feedback. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar. And as always, go Blazers. <laughs>